thing, but it was <laughs> It was nice. Okay. All right. All right. Well, mine was good. I started out in the dark, but um, yeah, you <laughs> remember I had a blackout. Yeah. We had a black, we had some trees um, fall down. And, mm. But thank God I'm able to see in the light now. <laughs> <laughs> You know that song that says "Walk in the Light." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Amen. Well, I I can certainly attest that it's been a week. Um, <laughs> it's been, you know, as we wind down the semester here at the school, um, I'm, I'm finishing up some things, and so, as you can well imagine, uh, I'm excited but exhausted at the same time. So you got mm -hmm. as work that's got to be done, and you got to preach, and then you got to prepare to teach. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesdays and so and so I found yesterday an opportunity just to be on Facebook and post my little jokes and um <laughs> enjoy myself so yes that's good, good. good. That's good. you know yeah. so you gotta have an you gotta have an outlet and have moments to relax and rest and put right. all right we're going to begin by now looking at Paul and going to begin to engage him directly now. Uh, let me pull up the slide. What am I doing here? Share screen. And here. And All right. Um, tonight, we're going to really cover Paul and salvation. First hour, we're going to do a introduction of Paul, just kind of the world that he's coming from. And then second hour, we're going to talk about what Paul, how does Paul look at salvation? Um, we have speculated what Paul says about salvation. Um, and we come up with our own theories, just like a whole lot of folks come up with about a lot of theories about other things. And we'll, we'll dive into that. But uh, what does, what, how does the scriptures, how does Paul you know, how do we read, how do we look at salvation in the, from the perspective of Paul? And then the third hour will be, how do we faithfully preach that message today to our context? And so I'm going to introduce the man. I'm going to talk about uh, his view, outlook on salvation. And then we're going to talk, we're going to wrap up by talking a little bit about um, what he talks about his how we can faithfully preach uh, that in, in our modern context. Now, um, with, with your chapters tonight, I will go over that next week. And so just save your thoughts on that. I might make some allusions to it tonight, but I'll, I'll pick it up on next week in the first hour and then uh, head into the next subject matter. So thank you for reading it. Um, I just, I'm going to uh, kind of loop that in for next week. Uh, but let's begin. Um, last week, we kind of really talked about the three contexts of preaching. We talked a little bit about what, well, what did we, what, what were the three contexts of preaching? Um, let me get my thoughts because I have three glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the three contexts we talked about. Um, talk about our lives that it has to be for the church has to be the world and it has to be for the preacher yes so we talked yes. about that when you come when it comes down to the preaching moment there are three things to be considered mm -hmm. uh, there is the world you know because the world uh the world somehow shapes preaching in that moment um then there is the uh there is the church our traditions shape our preaching but then there is also um ourselves we bring ourselves to this moment um and so that those those things are all to be considered and i then i brought it in and even when it comes down to paul when you study the life of paul you know our modern theology the, the church has their view on paul um the uh, world has its view on paul and you will have your view on Paul, uh, whether it is favorable or not. You will have your own type of view on the apostle Paul. And that's gonna influence 
And so one of the things I would always caution, and that is to be mindful, to know, uh, to be mindful of your views. Um, it's nothing wrong with having them. You just got to be mindful of them and also weigh them, balance that, uh, to be sure that, hey, um, you're not allowing one to influence all of, you know, so be, be careful, you know, because sometimes we allow too much of ourselves to influence uh, that moment. And so you want to be, you want to be careful, want to be careful as you approach, you want to be, you want to be mindful of your, uh, your, the world, you want to be mindful of the church traditions, and you want to be mindful of your own selves, uh, and know, and, and so that you can kind of, when you approach the, uh, preaching moment um you can all those can be taken into consideration but now let's look at paul because paul believe it or not is an interesting character uh paul is an interesting character um let me begin off by using a quote from second peter and again the lectures are the lecture is up on google classroom second peter Chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means, or patience means wisdom, salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them, speaking in them of these matters. His right, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So <clears throat> what a, I, I want to hint on that, that phrase that his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. That is that Paul does not always, that sometimes Paul has a way of confusing people. Uh, Paul, you know, and just look at look at the various interpretations look at how people have come up with doctrines and philosophies uh behind paul and and many times a lot of traditions have been developed out of things that paul didn't even intend to say you you'll find people preaching sermons you know um there's a, a, there's a sermon out there's a there's a preacher and I won't call names for the sake of being ethical and, but there are some preachers that are out that will suggest and they'll preach from Paul you know that women should have their head covered that that's their philosophy that's their theology and they get that directly from Paul um, you know but again that's an interpretation that's that that's them reading either from their church tradition or from their own personal theology. They're reading that into the Apostle Paul, and many people have been confused. Uh, many people are confused by the word or writings of Paul. And so that's why it takes uh, critical study. Uh, we gotta be careful of our own biases. Because uh, I shared this last week. You and I do not come to the moment of either the study or the pulpit, we don't come as a blank slate. We come already with our biases, already with our opinions, already with our assumptions. We come with that. And, and, and it's okay, it's okay. You gotta be mindful of it. And also realize uh, that if you put too much of it, you might distort, uh, you know, your experience is good, but be careful that your experience does not distort uh, the original meaning of the message or the principle that you're trying to get out of there. Last week, we discussed the three contexts of preaching, namely the world, the church, and the preacher. Understanding these are helpful so that we can faithfully proclaim the gospel. We come to our discussion of Paul. Paul is one of the most notable figures in the New Testament. However, as noted by Peter, much of the writings uh, Paul's writings can be quite confusing and lead to much confusion. There are those who look to Paul as the standard, while others shudder at applying the teaching of this sage. And so there are those who will say, everything that Paul said, that's what you got to do. Then there are those on the other hand that will say, oh, no, there's some, you know, not everything is for us. 
uh, there are some things that are culturally bound. Um, and so you, you and, and I would say that you have you will have to make that decision at this moment. You know, there are some things that are just that there are those who again say, I'm going to follow everything that Paul said. Now, I don't know how rational and how logical that is, uh, because if you tried to follow everything, the letter by letter of the law, we probably you're going to mess up on something. Um, so uh, there but. For the, for instance, there are those who suppose that all that flows from the writings of Paul should be normative in Christian practice. Hence, their preaching will reflect this. Others hold that there are some items discussed in his writings that must be considered in context of, of a given passage. However, to understand the literature produced by, uh, we must begin by studying the person behind the writings. And so, yeah, I, I, in order for us to get a handle um, and I, I wish this course was, um, this course, if, if we could, we would go book by book of Paul's letters, but we don't have that time, which is the reason why I chose selected themes uh, in order to deal with. But um, there's so much rich material in Paul, uh, but Paul can be misread. Paul can be misunderstood. Um, and so I think what we want, what I want to do is I want to put the context of Paul or context of his writing up before we get to his literature. Let's find out who this man is. Uh, who, who is this Paul? Who is this fellow? Let's talk a little bit about him. To begin our discussion about this person, we discovered that he was a well-educated Hebrew. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And if you know anything about the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin is, has gave them their first king, gave Israel its first king, namely Saul. Y'all remember Saul, uh, the first king of Israel, the one who disobeyed and consequently was rejected. Uh, him and his family was rejected uh, because of disobedience. Uh, we could go on a tangent with that, but we won't. Um, um, he was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. Much information that we know about him are from Acts and his own writings. And so in Acts, you will get a picture of Paul's conversion and many of his ministry exploits. Okay, let me say that again. You will get a, in Acts, you will get a picture of his conversion and we'll get to that later. And you will get a picture of his ministry exploits, his missionary journeys. You will find, you found Paul, you know, do, and uh, many of his own persecutions. Um, you discover in the writings of Paul that many, that he suffered greatly because uh, of, for the name of Jesus. Um, that, I think there's a, a point that we could apply there, and that is that um, uh, I think it was uh, Louis Farrakhan who said something to the, to the effect of hard trials are necessary for the establishment of truth. And all these years I remember that. Hard trials are necessary for the establishment of truth. One more time, that's a good statement. Hard trials are necessary for the establishment of truth, which is to say that to do good, to seek to do good, does not necessarily mean that you will not endure trials. If you don't get anything from, if, if we don't draw any type of principle from the life of Paul, I think one of the lessons that we can draw is this, that his was a life defined by suffering. A life defined by suffering. Um, and so you find a lot of that in the book of Acts. Um, what you'll discover is that in the beginning part of Acts, uh, chapters, I would say about one to about nine, um, Peter, first couple of chapters, Peter is the prominent figure. 
But after Paul's conversion, Paul then becomes the prominent figure. And so uh, you'll notice that uh, beginning, Peter is the prominent figure. You know, he's, you know, he's really the, he's the first one that preaches at Pentecost. Um, but at the end, uh, but to, as the, as the second half of Acts comes in, you, Peter sort of fades in the background and you see Paul really taking on and taking leadership and going to the Gentiles uh, to proclaim the gospel. And so you'll, you'll find that in Acts. But another way you'll learn about Paul is you'll learn about Paul through his writings. So when you read Galatians, you'll get a, a picture of Paul. He, he give, especially chapter one, chapter one and chapter two, and somewhere in chapter four, uh, he gives you a, a brief snapshot of himself. Um, uh, First Corinthians, uh, there's some inkling of him. Uh, you'll learn a lot, first, especially First Corinthians chapter 15, you'll learn a lot about Paul. Um, Philippians, uh, Timothy, uh, th th there, are, there are scattered references, um, especially Paul talking about his call and his conversion. Um, Paul's conversion was so meaningful and so profound that it all it shows up in a lot of his writings. Paul almost never really forgave himself because of what he because of what he did. And again, I'm gonna come back to that uh, as we come as we talk about his conversion. But Paul. In all honesty, uh, Paul has his conversion means so much to him. Um, I think that there's a good point there to just echo and just say how you and I ought to cherish and value our own story, especially when preaching. I know we talk. I, 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 I uh, that was there was an old bishop. His name is Bishop Late Bishop David Ellis, Greater Grace Temple. The late Bishop David Ellis once said to his son, "Blessed is the one who can testify without preaching, and preaching and preach without testifying." Uh, that was his. That was his statement, uh, meaning that hey, if you get up to preach, preach. Your 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 testimony has nothing to do with it. I, I kind of beg to differ. I believe. I believe that your story is important and that in some way, now the sermon ought not all be about, it, it ought not to always be about you, you know, uh, but in, there are some passages, there are some texts where you find yourself in that text and in that sermon, you, can, you almost can't help yourself but just talk about the experience that you've had with God in that moment. So I would say never negate your story. Never negate where you come from. Never negate your experience, just like Paul was able to talk about his experience on several occasions. I wish we could do it. I wish we could run through that. I wish we could. I don't have time. But if I would, if I could, I would. Paul talks about that. His experience with God on so many levels. Yeah. You have a story. Um, and so you find Paul's story showing up in his writings. <clears throat> he comes from a place that is insignificantly insignificant presently, but it had it held importance in his time. That place was Tarsus. Uh, uh, Gunther uh, Bornkam shares this reflection. Paul came from a strict Jewish family, 
uh, living in the dis, uh, d Dispara, uh, the city of Tarsus, where he was born about the beginning of our era, was the capital city of the region and Roman province of Cilicia. It is situated close to the Mediterranean at the foot of the Tar Tars Tarsus mountain. On the road leading over the high passes from Asia Minor to Syria, although it is insignificant to date, in Paul's time, its favorable situation for trade and commerce have made it a have made it a flourishing uh, Hellenistic city. That's what that was supposed to be. Um, I was talking in Texas. Uh, it was supposed to be Hellenistic city. So Paul comes from Paul comes from an area. The Tarsus that was highly significant uh, in his day. Highly uh, was a place of a profound influence. Um, one of the ways we learn about Paul is through the letters to the churches that he shared relationship with. Paul was genuinely proud of his heritage of faith. To be a Jew was a badge of honor. Think about that. To be a Jew was to, it was a badge of honor. We do have time, let's do this. Uh, go ahead, open your Bibles to Philippians 3. I wanna show you how proud he was of his background. Philippians chapter three. Okay, and in Philippians chapter three, uh, you find in verse number three, um, you find Paul's words. For it is we who are the circumcision, who serve God by the spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself, have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Listen to what Paul says. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Listen how he describes himself. A Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal persecuting the church, as for the righteousness based on the law, Faultless. Paul says, I, he's talking to Judaizers who place confidence in their own human ability, in their own way of doing things, that trust in their own works to gain them, give them favor with God. And Paul says, I, honestly, I could do the same. However, you know, he said, I, I have a good resume. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I mean, Paul is really, he's really going in on these folk. You know, uh, I got this. You know, I have a reason to boast. I have a reason to brag. You know, I, I have a great heritage. Next week we'll talk, and, and not next week, in our next lesson, we'll talk a little bit about why that's so important for us to think about. But to be a Jew, this goes back to my original point, was that it was a badge of honor. In fact, there was a tendency <clears throat> to look with disdain on those who were not Jewish. Uh, it, was, it was this inferiority superiority complex that because of who I am, I'm superior and you're inferior. Now, where do you, does that still exist today? And if so, where? Right here in America. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. 
with the uh, Euro European American Caucasians. Mm -hmm. They feel that they are superior to, to black people mm -hmm. and yeah. minorities. Anybody really? Absolutely. You know they have their. Uh, uh, it's like in India, they have the same thing where you're uh, certain, like they have the, now they have the Puerto Ricans uh, higher than Afro-Americans now, but it's a stature where the Caucasians are here and everybody else hmm. is on a certain level, yeah. but they're top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Yes. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yeah. We also have it in churches. Yeah. 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 We have we have it in we have it in churches. Um, and I could think of a few that denominationally that if your person wasn't a bishop, an mm -hmm. elder, or somebody of a high rank, um, you you could only marry somebody who came from that same class. Mm. That same thing. If mm -hmm. their people were educated and you were not, you were not the person to marry in that group. Certainly. And that and that said a lot. And not only did it just go with education, it went with race. Yeah. Yeah. Jobs, locations. I mean, there are there are some situations. Mm. You know, you're not certain color or whatever. Yeah. So that, that system still works. It still happens. Still is. Yeah. We have it even in our own culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, if you're light skin, if you're dark skin, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, um, zip code, you yeah. know, where you live, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's one more angle I want you. There's one more, and I, I, somebody's gonna put their finger on it, but there's one more. There's one more. Our homes. That's one. That, getting close with our children not there it's another one mm. women mm. Yeah, sexism. Uh, sexism yes 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 definitely yes um, anytime you can tell a woman what she can and cannot do you know mm. and and treating her as she is you know and using the scriptures <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Using the scriptures, <laughs> you know, yes. to boister that idea. Yes. You know, a woman ought to submit so to the man. Yeah, look. <laughs> you know, that whole issue of submission, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that, that's very, you know, the, <laughs> and the scripture really calls for mutual submission among each other. A lot of people miss yeah. that. That's, that was going to bring that up. They missed that. They miss that. There's a mutual submission. <laughs> you know, yeah. you go right to Ephesians chapter 5. There's a mutual submission. But, you know, this inferior, this superiority, inferior, inferiority complex is so real. It's, you're, again, you all mentioned it. It's racial. It's uh, social. It's economical. It's, ac it's education. I mean, it's sexist. It's it exists in so many facets in our world. That's why I think Solomon was right when he made the statement, there's nothing new under, under the sun. The sun. Yes. You know, um, <clears throat> so we, we, I mean, this whole being a Jew, I mean, they thought they were the best, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody else. I mean, they were the cream of the crop. To be a Jew was a badge of honor, uh, but not realizing <laughs> that they were marginalized by the by the Greco by the Greco Roman government. Yet they, they yet they were bragging about being something. Have you ever met people? That, uh, have you ever met people that bragged about being something and didn't have anything? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. it's it's almost like people that brag about you know how you um um there, there was um uh, the house negro and the field negro, you know, and I suspect that there and I, we wasn't didn't live during that period. I suspect 
that there were those who still thought, uh, I'm, I'm better than, because you worked in the house. Uh, but um, you just worked in the house. Uh, it didn't make you know, because you're still a Negro and you were still in slavery. And, and, and I think sometimes we forget uh, that just because you have a little bit more doesn't make <laughs> you any better. Right. right. I, I had a brother-in-law who was an alcoholic. And I, I have to laugh when I hear that because he said he was better than the drunks in the street because he watched PBS. But he still was a drunk in the middle of my floor. But, <laughs> but, but he was better than the other ones because he watched PBS. Mm, mm. He needed something to make himself yeah. superior. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a false sense of security. Um, that's what it is. It's a, it's a false sense of security. To, to the, the Jewish faith as it was known had changed because the world was different. Uh, the, the faith that, that was Old Testament, much of the rituals, a lot of that stuff was undergoing change because during that time uh, in, in Paul's life, uh, there was a lot, a lot of change. The world was changing. Um, and I, 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 there was... And, and again, there's another statement. There's another description of how that change was effective. Um, the old sheltered environment of the palace was a thing of the past. The world was has had expanded to a degree uh, hitherto unknown. Uh, many were many just uh, brought back to the temples were still directed for the old gods. Please, uh, please continue to serve and sacrifice to be uh, uh, sacrifice were continue to be offered. But these were obsolete, and the myths about the gods were a spent force, no longer capable of satisfying the individual's longing for protection and blessing, salvation and redemption in this world and the next. Everywhere, a process was afoot of syncretizing the old religious religions with new ones, streaming in especially from the East, and honor and vigor these were. Uh, the greater there were attractions, a whole host of mystery cults and doctrines of salvation, promised eternal security and deliverance from the powers of feet uh, of death. But this was also the time when there was a radical rationalistic criticism of the various religions, which is in which in the shape of diverse philosophies, reaching even the man in the streets. Uh, and so the point that I'm that that this that this quote is trying to get to was that the religion of Paul was in competition with the other religion. That's, that's uh, somehow uh, my computer did not, and again, it did, y'all forgive me, it did not migrate over, I, I did that and it didn't come back where I suspected it should have. But the point of that particular quote was this, that the religion of the Jews was now not the primary influ influence. They were now in competition with other religious backgrounds, other religious philosophies. And the same is true today. There was a time when the Christian faith had a significant influence. Just think about it. Now, that is not me saying that America has been a Christian nation. That is not what I'm saying. Because in no time, and in no way, and I, I, this is just my own personal philosophy, I will argue this, in no way has this ever been a Christian nation. Anytime you can take land from someone, mm. you're not a Christian nation. Anytime you can, uh, mm. uh, you can, oppress another people group, go to their land, steal them from, I mean, America has had a legacy of stealing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You stole land, then you stole people from their land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you continue to steal. I mean, the, the, there is a generational thing going on. Here. And so, but the point I'm making is that there was a time when what they what they call Christianity was a primary influence. Their the Americanized version of Christianity. 
not the I, I did not say the authentic version of the Christian faith, but there was a time when the that there was a version of the Christian faith that was being practiced, and it was and had influence in the political sphere. But now, I'll, I'll say this: even with this president, I mean, he's had evangelical leaders in his ear, but unfortunately, much of what we see in terms of has given Christianity a very bad name. And that's, uh, again, that's just a thought that I wanted to bring out. But we no longer, the Christian faith no longer enjoys a place of influence. There was a time, I was talking to a colleague this morning, and one of the things we noted particularly in the context of the black church. There was a time when the black pastor spoke and people actually listened. The church had a significant influence. They were doing things, they were active. Now look at it. Hmm. You, you, I mean, um, and this is not to be disparaged. Uh, I don't mean I don't I don't want us to despair on this, and I don't want us to just get discouraged. But I, I do want us to acknowledge that this is where we are. You know, uh, I do believe things can change, but right now this is where we are. Mm -hmm. And so, just like Paul, it just like the uh, the Jewish faith in Paul's day, so it is in our day. Christian faith continuously undergoes critical um, issues um, and it's not it doesn't have the same influence as it once did we got a there's a there's religious pluralism um we talked a little bit last week about post uh, modernism uh post modernism and post modernism looks it says whatever you believe is right is whatever, you know. Um, you want to worship a cat? Worship a cat. You know, whatever, 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 whatever your, you know. And and then you got those who who, who say I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. <laughs> yeah. You know the. I mean, this is this is the climate that we are living in, um, and I think we have to be certainly certainly mindful of that. Um, that this is the climate that we minister in. Um, Paul was a member of the Pharisees. In fact, he was, he was, he had advanced at one time. He had advanced in among, uh, among his peers, many of his peers. Paul may have been a student of Gamaliel, who was a renowned Jewish thinker. From Acts and the letters of Paul, we discovered that he was an injurious, one who persecuted the church. Acts chapter 9 records an instance where he was traveling to Damascus in an effort to throw some persons in prison. However, Christ intersected his life and gave him a new purpose, which was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul would become part of God's mission in reaching all nations. And that, that last phrase is what I want you to keep in mind. That Paul would become God's, God, Paul would become part of God's mission in reaching all nations. That's going to really be hit home next in our next lecture. But I want to get back to that. I want to go now and hone in on that conversion piece for Paul. Because Paul was an injurious, a persecutor of the church. Paul... Um, <clears throat> would commit people to prison. Uh, uh, in fact, when you read Acts, uh, especially the latter part of Acts, uh, chapter 7, uh, around 57 to 59, I believe, you discover that Paul was there holding the, uh, the coat of the people who stole Stephen. Uh, and then Paul, in chapter 8 of Acts, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 4,
Paul goes ravaging house to house. Yeah. And then chapter nine, he's on his way to mm -hmm. Damascus. And all of a sudden, God stops. And, he, and a light shines from heaven above the brightness of the noonday sun. Falls to the earth and Christ says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Hard for you to kiss against a prick. And, and, and Paul, Saul says, well, who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He didn't say you're persecuting the church. He said, you're persecuting me. You, because when you, per, when you persecute the church, you are persecuting Jesus. Because the church is Christ's bride. Yes. It is the one of, of whom Christ died for. But watch how God instantaneously changes this man and when God changes him unfortunately his conversion is not believed by some of the disciples <laughs> yes at first they were like do you not know who this man is yes yeah. like me you want me to teach him yeah, yeah. Paul, you know um um Ananias <laughs> And yes. was responsible, and God said to Ananias, "I want you." There's a man praying <laughs> named Saul, and 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 notice what Ananias. Ananias says, "Lord, do you not know who this is?" And I can picture the Lord like, "Like really? Are you said? Did you just really ask me that question?" I know they say there's no such thing as a dumb question now, but that was a dumb question. Um, it says, "You know who this is?" And the Lord has, "Yeah, I know who it is." but I know what I've done. And, and again, the disciples, this man is praying. Nah, can't happen, won't happen. Okay. You froze for a minute. Oh, I did? For me. Oh, hold on. Did you just say that last part? Okay, uh, let, me, let, me, let me find out, what did I just say? Uh, it's bad, I, I'm still, you know, I'm getting younger. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the point I was trying to make was I think the point that I just made was that his testimony was not believed by the early disciples. Yeah. So, but I I want to bring in this other this point. Um and that point is this. Um that Paul's testimony was so profound and meaningful that he took every opportunity to talk about it. I, I, I just keep going, I'm, and I, I'm going right back. Again, when he thought about what he did, mm. I mean, he almost never forgave himself. Maybe that was that thing. Yeah, there you go. That's a good speculation. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, Paul had to live with that reality. This is what I have done. But the grace of God was certainly present in my life. And I think that's our, that's our story. If nothing more, nothing less. I think that's, I think that's our story. That no matter how bad we are, our bad does not overcome God's grace. Amen. Absolutely. Your bad don't overcome God's goodness. Be as bad as you want, or at least think you're as bad as you want. <laughs> you know, but your you being who you are does not stop God from being who God is. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a break. It is 6.49. I'll give you a little extra minutes. We'll come back at 7 o'clock. Um, and it, 
Uh, oh, wait a minute. Before I do all that, there, is there any questions or comments? I forgot. I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to leave this lecture and not and not facilitate any questions or comments. I'm good. Okay. All right. See you at seven. All right. Okay. Hmm. What do I need to do? Excuse me at seven. I need to my bottle of water. Hey, what's up? How are you doing? Sharon? Uh-huh. What you doing this evening? Um, everybody wants to disturb that. Yeah, everybody's having a great, <laughs> having a great life right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not much. I just like. Oh. I was trying to figure out if you wanted to come over tonight. That's good because I'm in class at nine o'clock. So it was going to be after nine thirty anyway. Yeah. Okay, we're closer to what time? Back. Okay. Um. Okay. Do I have a choice? Then I don't have a choice, do I? No, buddy. I want to sign on now. Okay, let's go down this for now. Thank you. 
the picture right here. <clears throat> All right. So we will now move on from talking about introducing a little bit of Paul. <clears throat> Again, the, the, you know, the the material was just designed to give you a brief overview, nothing major. But I want to begin now on our first issue that we got to really wrestle with when it comes down to the Apostle Paul, and that is how does Paul talk about salvation? Um, how does Paul discuss the issue of salvation? One of the greatest questions that continue to invite the engagement of, of the human imagination is how does what, God, what, how does what God has done in Christ apply to us and how can one become close to God? There are a myriad of theories that could be discussed regarding redemption and how one can access such. For instance, in the Roman Catholic view, there is a salvation by faith, but there is the addition of good works uh, used to be to bring one into favor with God. The Protestant view, salvation is holy by God's grace through faith apart from the human act, apart from human works. To really understand this, it is imperative to discuss how Paul views salvation. Uh, we, we begin with Paul's words composed to the church at Corinth as he begins his argument against those who, are, who deny the resurrection of the dead. So <clears throat> before I get to the text, um, everybody has a view as to how one can become close with God. Everybody has a view on that. Um, you have those who suggest you, you baptismal regeneration. You have those who suggest, uh, I mean, uh, you name it, they got it. Uh, I, but if we really want to talk about what salvation is, and what it meant to Paul, I think it's best that we try to understand it in the context of Paul. Um, I want to begin by rooting what he talks about in terms of salvation in the gospel. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So what we will notice foundationally is that Paul roots everything he's going to talk about in what God has done in Christ. Now, I want you to probably, if you are taking notes, um, and if you have your outline there, you want to write something down like this, that Paul will root it. Paul's discussion on salvation is rooted in what God has done in Jesus Christ. Okay. When you hear Paul talking about salvation, it will be rooted <clears throat> in what God has done in Jesus Christ. We can't even get to how you get saved until we've discussed what God has done in Christ and where that begins. Um, for Paul, the crux of the Christian message is the salvific work of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ was put to death. Um, it was a side note. I used, to, I used to say now, I gotta be careful of saying it now. I used to say he died. No, he was put to death. 
Jesus was put to death by his own creation. Was put to death. But raised by the power of God on the third day. This is the essence of the faith. For Paul, it is this story that continues to provide redemption to all. It is this story, which is the climax to the story of Israel, which is summarized in this manner. <clears throat> the story that holds together the Gospels and Paul might be summarized like this. The God of Israel acted decisively in the person of Jesus to restore God's rule and reconcile the whole world to himself. When we talk about salvation, we are talking about God working deliberately in Jesus to bring humanity back to God's self. That is the essence of what God does. God is working, God has worked in Christ and God is constantly at work now to bring us to reconcile humanity back to God. So, but not only that, reconcile humanity to each other. That's the, that's the plan. That's, that's how the gospel, that's how the story can be summarized. When, so when Paul is talking, Paul is talking about God reconciling us through the work of Jesus. Not only reconciliation, but God's rule. That's what, we, that's what we mean when we talk about the kingdom. We're talking about God's reign, God's rulership, God's sovereignty. It is to say that God, that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. That's the gospel. I want you to think about this. The work of Jesus was not simply to start a new work, but he was sent to the world to complete an assignment. Say that again, the work of Jesus was not to come and start a new work, but it was to complete an assignment, which has its roots in God's dealing with Israel. Perhaps we've never thought about this, but God, but uh, the, the first coming of Christ was a continuation of the story of Israel. God had an immense plan for the people of Israel. As we think about the story of redemption, it has always been God's intent that a community would be formed whereby other nations could be drawn. This is reflected in God's encounter with Abram while he was yet in his father's house. Think about this. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And then you all families of the earth will be blessed. Now everybody shouts over that. And they go claiming the blessing of Abraham. Uh, but the blessing of Abraham was not prosperity for prosperity's sake. It was not land for land's sake. 
God promised Abram, Abram at that moment, I'm going to form a community. I'm going to give you a lineage. And out of and in you, everybody is going to be blessed. Now that's the blessing of Abraham. God's intent was to form a nation out of the loins of Abram. Hence, he was commanded, listen at this, to leave the house of his father. He has everything at his fingertips. The wealth of his fathers would become his. Nevertheless, he's told to forsake that and go where God sends him. God made a promise to him. He was told that a great nation would come from him and he would be a blessing. The line that holds the greatest significance is that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That in Abram, salvation, God would draw other nations to Abram or through to other nations would be brought, uh, would be blessed in Abram. That's a better word for it. Yeah. Abram was just simply the conduit, the instrument. And what Abram had to do was obey God, even when obeying God was not convenient. Because I do, I believe you and I know following God isn't always convenient. It's not always comfortable either. You're not always gonna like it. <clears throat> there was a song out we used to sing, um, your will is what I want. Your will is what I want. Your will is what I want for my life. And we sung that song so happily. Mm -hmm. Now look at us. <laughs> now look at us. Sarah, you want to say something? Yeah, I love that song. Actually, my um, I have my choir singing. My kids, they love that song. I love it too. <laughs> Your will is what I want. But that will be really want yeah want to know what his will is for us right right Are you willing to still say yes that song by kind of yes will your heart and soul say yes if i told you what i really need mm -hmm. heart and soul still say yes yeah so yep it's that's the challenge mm -hmm. you know abraham had, had to leave everything and go where God told him. And he went off of a promise um, that in him, all the nations of the earth, what a promise, what a promise. Now, in the prophetic writings, there's a singular statement that confirms the mission of Israel to the other nations. <clears throat> Isaiah 50, 42, verse 6. Listen at these words. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people. Notice that phrase, a light to the, other na to the nations, or King James will say a light to the Gentiles. Um, verse 6, uh, Isaiah 49, verse 6. He says, it is, too, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob, to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, based upon what we're reading what we've read so far about Abraham, Abram, and the nations of the earth being blessed by him, and Israel um, being um, a light to the other nations. What are you getting? Very 
what, what, what is this, what do you get, what does this tell you about salvation? Comes with a price. Comes with a price. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. And what? that it was all planned out. It was, uh, it is strategic. God is strategic. strategic. Yeah. Now, but there's another thought that comes out of that. A light to the nations. Mm -hmm. And then you all nations of the earth will be blessed. What does that say? Think about it. In you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It comes with a promise. It's a promise. <laughs> what is that promise though? Let's be specific. And you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, and you'll be a light to the nations. The Gentiles are gonna be blessed. Is that, is that it? Gentiles are gonna be blessed. So what does that say about salvation? That it's for everyone. Everybody. Yes. Yeah. Universal, it's unlimited, it's unrestricted. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because you will get, you will find out, Paul will say, that in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. That's right. right. right, That's right. right. Mm -hmm. There's neither male nor female. Yes, it don't matter. It don't mm -hmm. even matter. So this whole entitlement that the Jews had, mm -hmm. because they were braggadocious about who they were. We they came were. from the stock of Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're from the stock of Abraham. Mm. And so we have a reason to boast. And, and, and sadly, Israel misunderstood their purpose. Mm. They didn't realize that God had a universal concern for humanity. Think about the story of Jonah. As funny as it is, there's a bigger picture to that story. God was trying to teach Jonah that, listen, I don't care who you don't like. <laughs> I, I don't care who you have a problem with. Your is that's not my issue. Listen, I don't care what your issue is. I don't care what your what your problem is with. My concern is for all people. And so, what God was simply what 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 we're learning from the narrative of Abram in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then uh, that statement that. Um, a light to the other nations, that's a promise that salvation is universal. So there's no chosen people. You know, yeah, God chose them for a purpose. God chose them. Yeah, he did. Chose them. Yeah, but I'm talking about like with the Jewish people right to this day. Yeah. Still believe that they're the chosen people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that there's this entitlement. We got it, you know. Um, but what God is teaching us through this yeah. text yeah. is that our perhaps, perhaps, let's entertain this thought for a minute. Perhaps our being selected and chosen by God is not for us. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. When you think about your own call to preach mm -hmm. or your own call to do ministry, it yeah. is, how dare we mm. become arrogant, puffed up, 
lifted up in pride, I'm called. <laughs> I'm anointed. We just, we're just a part of the strategy. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, this is the generation of the anointed idiots. <laughs> <laughs> My God, yes. <laughs> yeah. Just mm -mm -mm. everybody, oh, everybody's anointed. Everybody's, everybody's got this call. I got a call on my life. That's beautiful. I, I, but perhaps your call is not about you. Yeah, it shouldn't be. And Israel lost sight on that. They got caught up in the fact that they were chosen. Okay. But they didn't realize. They're still caught up on it. Huh? They're still caught up on it. Yeah, we're chosen. But they're chosen, them being selected <clears throat> was to be a, as Isaiah said, was to be a light to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. No other purpose. Now, that was my message today, Reverend, <laughs> on the prayer line. It was, let your light so shine. Yeah. <laughs> that people Amen. may see good works. Mm -hmm. And glorify. We are called to do what Israel failed to do. Mm. Oh. Many people think or conceive of salvation as a get out of hell ticket. <laughs> what? Think about that. Uh -oh. Many of us conceive, um, uh -oh. I'm saved, so I'm going to him. <laughs> going to him yeah. and that's our belief system uh, <laughs> mm. uh, I'm going to get in trouble with this one you know there's a, there's a song out um, and that's sung mainly in the Pentecostal traditions uh, I'm not going to hell oh no mm -hmm. I'm not going to hell oh no hell mm -hmm. is deep hell is wide <laughs> hell ain't got no joy inside <laughs> I don't know if y'all heard that song before. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> but we conceive of salvation as a get out of hell ticket. And now I'm on my way to heaven. And partially, I mean, again, thank God for eternal life. Mm -hmm. Thank God that when we leave here, yes, we'll be able to dwell with the ancestors and we'll be able to be in the presence of God. For many, who, many of us who grew up in, in, in church, in the church world of Sunday school, youth groups, retreat and summer camps, the gospel narrative in, into which we were enculturated focused on what we might call individualistic and escapist vision of the work of Jesus. In these depictions, mm -hmm. the gospel is about my soul's salvation, offering me a chance to get to heaven when I die. And as for many of us, the primary promoter of such a vision was none other than the Apostle Paul schooled on the Romans' road to salvation. We walk from all sin, that's me, to the way to sin is death, I've got a problem. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's done something about my problem to confess Jesus as Lord and believe he's been raised and you will be saved. Yes, I get to heaven now when I die. If I only make Jesus Lord of my heart. While such a telling communication communicates some important facets of the gospel story, many of us have found that scripture itself generates questions that destabilizes such me-centered escapist systems. That is, sometimes salvation is too me-driven, individualistic. Um, 
there is that statement, I need to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. And again, there is to a degree, salvation does apply to us and does have that ramification of personalism to us. Um, mm -hmm. But in the same token, it's broader than that. It is, it is way broader than just me, I'm a sinner. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to hell because of my sin. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Confess your mouth, the Lord Jesus, leave in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there's, I'm not adding works righteousness to, to this, and I want, but you're going to see what I'm talking about in a minute. That salvation is just not about you escaping heaven. Or escaping, escaping, hell? escaping hell, thank you. That, 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 you know, um, that's, I mean, that's, that's a very, I mean, again, it's true. But if the only thing you can shout about is I'm going, I'm not going to hell, my goodness. That, that's not something that I mean, I get it. I, I'm glad I'm not going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. But there's more to this salvation than a get out of hell ticket. And I'm going my way to heaven. So glad. I'm gonna walk around heaven all day long, eating neck bones in heaven. Huh? There's more to that. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor. Yes. Reverend. Yes. There's, there's, over the years, I've always heard the, the expression, I'm sure you all heard it too. What saved always saved. Mm -hmm. that, that salvation, regardless of what you do, mm. you're always going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm not sure people have different ideologies on that or mm -hmm. different thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. but, but the idea of saying salvation really is, like you said, it's much larger because mm -hmm. it's not just you. Right. It's what stretches out, it, it like goes out to others. Yeah. It goes out to others. No different than you going to the grocery store, it goes out. Yeah. It's not, you know, it doesn't just stay with you. Yeah. That's the purpose. Yeah. Obviously, because Israel, they demonstrated things. Mm -hmm. But through them, it went out to us. Yeah. Um, how does that, how does once saved, always say, how does that fit or not fit in the salvation message? So, when we talk about salvation, we're talking about what God has done in Christ. And we talk about the fact that God has done what we were unable to do. Salvation is often described in terms of gifts. So those who come to Christ, you know, who become disciples of Christ, you, you are accepting, you are confessing and you are accepting what, what literally what God has done in Christ. Um, it fits into the, in this way. One saved always say, says this, that because salvation is a gift from God, I didn't earn it. If I could earn my salvation, then I can lose my salvation. That's, that's the philosophy. If I could earn my salvation, I can, but the fact that I did not earn my salvation, that it really says, I can't lose what I didn't earn. It also suggests that those who are in, who are truly followers of Jesus are kept by the power of God. It is not a license to say, I can do what I want to do. It's not a license to do what you want to do. It does say that those who are authentically, who have authentically become followers of Jesus, they are kept by the power of God so that they don't willfully just go out and do what they want to do. That doesn't change that they're going to make mistakes. That's right. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Salvation is a gift, and no, and and no, and and the, and the gift of God, according to that, is is irrevocable. But that don't mean you go out just. Go, I'm gonna go out and just shoot somebody now because I know I'm still going to hell. <laughs> uh-huh. nice. But a lot of people, um, a lot of people, I've heard it. They feel that way. Mm-hmm. They feel like, okay, I make that confession of faith, mm-hmm. and maybe I was legit, or maybe I wasn't. Mm-hmm. But it was my it's getting out of hell ticket. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm sitting here thinking about um, R. Kelly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think about R. Kelly Mm -hmm. and he 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 had a couple of songs and you know he spoke a little bit Mm -hmm. and then I think about his behaviors Mm -hmm. during the same time of the songs Mm -hmm. and I'm like okay Kelly Kanye what's going on Mm -hmm. you know you 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 know what what are you doing what are you Mm -hmm. did you get out did you get out of hell ticket is that where he is Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, well, is it taught, and is is taught, and is it a learned behavior? And the fact that um, that no one holds them accountable. Yeah. And we accept it. Mm-hmm. You know, no one speaks up. You know, um, <clears throat> he sings good. He makes money, and so for some people, you know, instead of this speaking out against, and 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 that's what happens a lot in our society when it's someone that is here Mm -hmm. um a lot of people don't want to come up against it because they don't want to be grouped which is wrong Mm -hmm. but people don't you know we're teaching that i mean we're learning that in our churches every day you know and no one say what what reverend good is talking about no one is speaking up saying that philosophy or that theology isn't correct you know, so it's like nobody wants to be the bad guy. It, so it, it's you know, and you know, I what my job is just to, I, you know, because I'm not giving you, I won't give you my personal take on it. Um, I'm going to give you what the philosophy teaches, um, but what it should not. Those who teach it should not be saying. I'll I'll say it this way, that oh, once saved always saved is a is a doctrine that says you can do whatever you want and you won't be held accountable. No, that's not what it says. What it says is that you are kept by the power of those who are those who can those who are truly followers of Jesus. They are kept by the power of God. That if they do sin, they have that ability to confess and, and make confession. Uh, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin and forgive us and, and forgive us of all our unrighteousness. That's the that's the promise. Um, but you don't willfully, we don't just go up and say, okay, I'm going to do what I want because grace and mercy is going to cover me. That's not, that's not the thought. That's not, that's not even the, anybody who teaches that, I would suspect, may not, may have gotten it wrong. And well, let me, let me clarify myself. Sure. Let me use an example. Sure. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not a follower of Joel Osteen. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. But Joel Osteen, I've seen his sermons mm-hmm. and um, I have nothing against the man. Mm-hmm. But he'll preach about how wonderful God is. Yeah. But see, he won't tell you mm-hmm. there's consequences. Right. That's right. what I'm talking about. Absolutely. It's being preached that, you know, if you do this, God is good. God will bless you. Your life will be blessed. Uh-huh. Yada, 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 yada. But mm-hmm. they don't want to go there and say, but there's a certain way you have to live. Right. There are certain things you have to do. Right. They don't talk about their sacrifices. If you say you're a follower, it don't mean, you know, I'm not saying it. I'm not getting into a debate whether you should drink, whether you shouldn't. Right. Things, you know what I mean? Right. But there's certain things that if you do this, mm-hmm. this will come with it, mm-hmm. you see. But they won't hold you accountable for that. They'll just tell you what the scriptures say, but they don't break it down that, yes, the scriptures say this, but if you do this, this is not in the alignment or in the will of God. So a lot of times they capitalize off of, I preach the word, but they're not breaking it down to what it really means. You're, going, you're, you're heading right into my, 
my last hour. That's be, you, you, you're headed right into that. We're going to get right to that too. Um, uh, um, eternal security with, does not negate accountability. Um, that one saved, always saved does not, uh, it does not suggest that there are no, that we're not held accountable for our actions. At least that's not how it should be taught uh, or how it should be understood. Um, I will, if I, if I can think of it this way, just remind me, somebody send me an email, I'll post a document uh, that will just kind of, uh, I'll post something on Facebook, or not on Facebook, on Google, a little article on it uh, for your further clarification, for your information. And then you can kind of uh, look at it from there. Um, because uh, there's there are implications to that, um, and I, I thank you for that question. Th thank you, thank you. Um, but salvation is not just a get out of hell ticket, and it's not a it's not a a license to just do what you want. There are requirements. You know, uh, the world the world was created by God that it was designated to be subject to the dominion of God through those whom God has chosen to facilitate his love and care. To be in the image of God is to become aware of one's relationship with God as sons and daughters, given the task to be good stewards of what God has created. So originally, when you look in Genesis 1 and 2, well, particularly chapter 1, verses 26, 27, 28, and I believe 29, um, when God made, gave, when God created them, when God created humanity in God's image, what else did God do? He spoke on it. He spoke, but what did he give the, what did he give the man and the woman? Right. Gave him dominion. 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 That is to say, we were called to be good stewards over God's creation. I'm going somewhere with this whole salvation piece. Uh, so walk with me just a little bit. We were called to be good stewards. Now, unfortunately, um, sin has rendered that, that we're not so, we're not good managers of what God has given. Sometimes we destroy what God has given. We mess up what God has given. But God is in the process, and I want you to hear this, of renewing the world. So although the world is jacked up, and it is, the world is crazy. It is. But that does not change the fact that God is renewing the world. Now, this is the bigger picture. And I want you to, this is the point I'm trying to get to. And I'm going I'm to I'm take my time and wrestle with it to make sure that we get it that we messed up. But God is in the process of renewing the world, transforming this world. But part of that transformation is to is that God we are part of that process as God transforms us into the image of Jesus Christ so God is transforming the world number one but in addition to that in God renewing the world God is transforming us so we are invited to be saved to be a part of God's program 
Sanctification is a role in that, which means that we're being made like Jesus. So I argue that salvation is not just about getting out of hell. Hmm. Salvation is about getting, is about, first of all, being, becoming a follower of Jesus and joining and becoming partners with God in this world so that we can change the nightmare of this world into the dream of God. That's right. That's right. If all, <clears throat> you see, let me tell you something. If salvation is all about getting out of hell, then we don't need that does not need to be social engagement. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Come on now. If 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 all we're doing is just waiting for the sweet by and by, <laughs> we don't need what do we got? Why have why do we why are we becoming community oriented? Listen, it, it don't really make a difference. Because we I'm going to heaven. And believe it or not, that's the perspective. Salvation is not just about you going to heaven. Right. And if that's the only thing you can shout on, that that's ah, you, you, you're misconstrued. Yeah. Salvation is about me being transformed into the image of Jesus. So then what does that mean, me becoming in the joining in the image of Jesus? I'm doing, I'm following the life of Jesus. What was Jesus like defined by? Service. Yes. So I am in partnership with God. So as to that the world that I see, I am not. I am more responsible to the world because I'm saved. Think about that. I am more responsible to the world because I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, my, my, my favorite subject, um, my, 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 and I'm not talking about me, please don't take it that way. Um, mm -hmm. I have a master's in organizational management. Mm -hmm. I retired from being a director of operations mm -hmm. in corporate America. I've always said that this is a business mm -hmm. transaction, <laughs> that God is the CEO. Mm -hmm and he's building his team mm -hmm. and we all sit at the table mm -hmm. if you accept the assignment yeah. but with the assignment comes challenges just like work mm -hmm. because it is work yeah and so when i used to work for ceos one of the things they would always say they, they would say you always seem to be cool and calm under stress and situations that should take you out and mm. and i would always say that you know i'm employed by you mm. but i work for god <laughs> and so i've always looked at ministry mm. as service mm. i look at work as service or whatever i do is service it don't matter to me position or title or all these things that people put so much weight into yeah. is service. When the dust settle, if you can be an example or help someone, yeah. be kind to someone, it doesn't matter if it's money, just even saying hi, just saying a good word, service. The service. service. It's the purpose. Yeah. And the purpose is I'm not trying to score brownie points. No. It's just service. If we could conceptualize and realize that at the end of the day, salvation isn't just about you getting out of hell. 
Now, there are moments where Paul will say that part of the implications of salvation is this, or part of the benefits were, rather, was the, that we have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the uh, kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. It's one of the benefits. But we're not saved to just escape the world. Because if, if salvation was about just getting out of hell and going to heaven right away, I think God would have just teleported us right away out of here. But the fact that we're still here in the earth says that we must partner with God on this journey. We are called to be agents of transformation. We are invited to partner with God in turning the nightmare of this world into the dream of God. That is what salvation is all about. This is what God is intending for the church. And this is what, this is what salvation looks like in the theology of Paul. That God has done what God has done in Christ. God has raised, Christ died and was raised up by the power of God. And God at this moment is renewing the world. And those who want to become a follower and accept the work of his son, Jesus Christ, you are being called and enlisted to be a change agent. That salvation is never just individualistic. It is communal. It's communal. Salvation is never individual, just individualistic. It is communal. Just like God intended for Israel to be a light to the nations, God has intended you and I to be a light to all people. Let your light so shine before people. They may see your good works. Glorify your father in heaven. Salvation is about impact, is about us partnering. I, I, and I did not see this until this year. When I read Paul, now I'm rereading Paul because I all I've been told was. You know, Romans road, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Uh, there ain't none righteous, no, not one. Way to sin is death, but to give to God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that was it. We were, and we were shouting on the fact that we were on our way to heaven and so glad about it. but we didn't talk about what it really meant to be saved. To be saved is to acknowledge what God has done in Christ. And why did God do what God did in Christ? Because God wants to reconcile the world to God's self. Ah. God wants to reconcile the world to himself, and God did that by sending Jesus. And as that reconciling work continues, we are invited to ex- acknowledge that sacrifice, accept it for ourselves, but now join the team and go and become an, an, an impact the world. That's what it means to be saved. Uh, You're not saved by good works, but you're saved for good works. You're saved to do, to do good to the least of these, the marginalized, the impoverished, The hurting, 
the frustrated. We'll talk about in the next hour, in our last hour together, we'll talk about what that looks like in the context of preaching. Does, are there any questions and or comments in this regard? Is there any, are, do, is, do I need to make anything clear? Or, you know, do we need points of clarification? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Sure. Just, just follow me up something. You started speaking about the requirements of salvation. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we said, call to be good steward, stewards, mm -hmm. follower of Jesus, mm -hmm. partner, partner of God, partner mm -hmm. with God. Mm -hmm. is, is that right? Correct. Partner of God with you. Pro partner okay. with God, yeah. Partner with God, mm -hmm. uh, which was to turn the world around because the purpose of salvation, he wants to reconcile the world to himself by sending Jesus. Yeah. You're in the same order? Yeah, in the same, so you're in the same order. So God, God uh, sent Jesus into the world to reconcile the world to God's self. Now, uh, God is still in that proc, you know, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that, that work of reconciling the world to God's self has not stopped. It's still going on. So you and I, first of all, are invited when we hear the preaching of the gospel, we're invited to become followers of Jesus by acknowledging that sacrifice and, and, and becoming followers. And, and us becoming followers, we become partners with God in that journey of turning this world around. You know, now, um, it, it may not happen all at one time, but I just wish that we all would get that mind, that perspective, that I, I, I got to make an impact wherever I go. Mm -hmm. That to become a follower of Jesus, to sign on to become a follower is to sign up to be an impact wherever you go. Not just, and if this pandemic has not taught us anything else, mm. is that our ministry is not relegated to the church building. Amen. I, I hope I clarified your question. Yes, yes, you did. Okay. Yes, you did. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, yeah. Any other? I could go on and on for this because this this here is such is so liberating, and it's more than just what we've been taught. Um, it, it it puts the story it puts the whole idea of salvation in its proper context, and what we're here for. Any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, let's say we take a break. We come on back at 8.03. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Um, Reverend, yes. before you go, sure. so I was looking at the um, PowerPoint presentation. Sure. I see, I see the lost like nine pages. Oh, no worries. What I'll do is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm gonna take that one down tonight. I'm gonna to make some edits, edits, and I'm gonna and by you give me till tomorrow afternoon. I'll eat, and I'll do this for everybody. I'll send you all the. I'll I'll put it back up there, or I'll send it to you all individually. If you all just send me your email, your email address should be on Google Classrooms. I'll I'm still learning Google Classrooms, so um, what I will do is I'll just send it to you all individually, um, and kind of go from there. If that's all right with you all. Yeah, but sometimes, yeah. Reverend Morrell, you might have to close it and go back in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I, I did that. My... Yeah, that happened a couple times to me, and I would close it out, okay. go back in, and it'll come back up. Okay. And if you oh, have any... okay, this is new to me too. So. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'm learning as we go. Well, so Connect the dots. Come yeah, back yeah. at uh, eight. Yeah, eight o three. You said eight o three. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. How come y'all keep putting those pretty pictures up and I don't know how to do it? Y'all got these gorgeous pictures. <laughs> when you go in your Zoom, there's a way that you can actually put up a picture. So well, I'm going to stop mine right now and you'll see mine. You see? I there's see. You're so pretty. 
Thank do you. you. Do you a picture actually come sure. up of me, um, Sarah? Or right, stop the video. Okay. Yep. Stop the video. Okay. You? Yep, it is. That's your Google page. That's the pay picture you got on your page, right? On your email profile. I added this to my just to Zoom because my um I missed my uh, my Google picture is different. Oh, okay. So so um you just after this shut down, you can go in and put your own picture up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right, because I did see something on um yeah, Zoom, YouTube saying that you can put a background on there too. Mm-hmm. I haven't learned so, how to do it yet. Yeah, um, it's 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 um just go to Google. It's it's like three steps. It's something called a virtual picture. You go to settings and you click on something, and then it, it'll say virtual some presentation, and then it'll give you the background. So can I go into settings while I'm still on this? You know what? I was wondering the same thing. I said, let me try it now. <laughs> I don't think I'll, I'll wait till the session is over. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. See I'll you in the field.
What happened? Okay. All right. All right. I thought everybody was gone. Huh. Oh, no. <laughs> I came back. I said, where did everybody go? I must have had to. No. I'll tell you, Zoom. I said, they must have thought class ended early. Okay. Well, no, here, we, no. here we go. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um. Uh, as promised, again, this might be the short, this is going to be the short one, but uh, we're going to do the, we're going to, I'm not going to rush it, but we, I definitely want to be more condensed. Because now where I want to get to, as soon as I can get, oh, stop, there you go. Um, the perp, I want to explain now where I'm going at with this course and the outline. So my goal is to talk about um, Paul's perspective on certain things. So next week we'll talk about slavery. Uh, we'll, we will deal with some of the passages that talk about slavery. Uh, we will engage some of the problems that, come, that have come with that. I will probably put some, if I can find them, I think there are some readings that I do have and uh, I, I will post them. I will let you know when I post them. Um, but then the last hour will always be spent on how can we faithfully proclaim the gospel from this text uh, or from a on or on that subject matter. Um, we will we will we will just kind of look at that in a different way. So that that's going to be the goal of every class, you know, going forward. We'll look at a subject matter. We, it may take, uh, you know, we'll talk about the views that have come along with it. And then the final hour, we'll talk about, okay, how can we faithfully preach salvation from the perspective of Paul or slavery from the perspective of Paul? How can we faithfully preach the gospel? Is it even possible? And I think that's going to be a, a question that we're going to have to wrestle with. Is that even possible? Um, uh, next week, I'm, I'm going to, as I promised, next week, I'm going to deal with uh, the chapters uh, in our first hour. And um, so I'm not going to assign your reading this week. Uh, only, um, I may post something just for your own personal um, insight and in information, but there is no required reading for next week because you've already read and, and I didn't go over it fully. So I'm gonna go over it next week in our first hour. That's gonna be my, my goal and I'm gonna really uh, deal with that. But um, more You're than- You're talking about chapters five and six, right? Correct. Okay. Um, but let me begin off by making this statement. <laughs> um, Preaching is not just another oratorical monologue that takes place on Sunday morning. Uh, it is not me just getting up spewing out my own, you know, I'm just getting up to read a speech. Um, and some people that's, all, you know, um, and, and this is why I'm, I tell people to be careful about what you talk say, because I've had people tell me, oh, I could just get up and preach. Um, you know, I can do that. Uh, and I'm, and part of me was like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, uh, cause a lot of people are not aware of the countless hours and I, that come along with preaching and everybody just can't do this. Um, pre preaching is, is, is if you're going to do it right and faithfully. Mm. If you're gonna do it right and faithfully, yeah, everybody can't do that. Um, it's it's more than getting up spitting and yelling and putting your hand behind your ear and, and saying, "Any all right?" That's more than that. <laughs> you know, uh, it's more than that. Um, um, the preaching moment is an opportunity to give people theological interpretation that is we are not just simply preaching from the bible you are already in chapter six reverend i i, I know <laughs> in chapter six, reverend. 
we are not just yeah. preaching from the Bible. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 and, I, and 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 Alan will talk about the fact that uh, we, you know, we're not, we're really, we to to really kind of call ourselves. He he really, what he really argues and says that it's really inaccurate to call yourself a preacher of the Bible. You are a preacher of the gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he's going to argue. That you know. So I hate you know. I I hate when people say, "Oh, I'm a Bible preacher." Okay, what does that mean? You know, I, no, I take joy out of being called a gospel preacher, you know, because that's my responsibility. My call is to preach the gospel. Now, the gospel, I'm preaching it from, as it's witnessed by the scripture. Now, um, um, so I'm not just preaching the Bible, you know, uh, uh, preachers say often say, "Well, I'm, I'm saying what the Bible says," and even that is pro problematic. Uh, and I think I talked mm. about this on the first night of our lecture. That's problematic. Talking about I, I'm preaching mm. what the Bible says. Okay, a lot mm. of preachers are doing that, but are you mm. preaching what the Bible means? There's a big difference. What did this text mean in its context, and then? Consequently, what does it mean for me now? How can I faithfully live out the gospel as a result of hearing this text? Now, I think our problem, I suppose our problem is our understanding of the gospel. Because we only, we, we believe that the gospel is what we do at the end of the sermon. Oh, and, and the sermon has nothing to do, and the, and, the, and the end of the sermon has nothing to do with the rest of the sermon that you just heard. So you mm -hmm. could be talking about giving, and the next thing you know, the preacher at the end, he died. Yeah, didn't he die? He died till I got satisfied. He died until... Yeah, until the, 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 the moon dripped in blood. He died until the sun refused to shine. He died until the stars fell out the sky. He died until the Milky Way did something. He died. <laughs> but early Sunday morning, he got up with all power. Ain't he all right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now again, mind you, nothing that went before that had anything to do with that. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. You know, but what Paul is trying to get us to understand or what we need, what, what I think the writer is trying to get us to understand that the gospel um, is not just the ending part of your sermon, but the gospel is how we live on a regular basis. How does the death, the burial, how does what God has done in Christ help me to live regularly? How does what God has done in Christ, how does that help influence my giving? How does what God has done in Christ influence um, the way I treat the poor? Am I making sense? Yeah. yeah. So if the gospel is not just he died, revving up the organ. No, put me in B. No, that's not that. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not saying that there are no moments, there are not moments when you won't tell the story. Oh yeah, you're gonna tell the story sometimes. But with preaching, we are giving people a lens by which they can look at the scriptures the world and themselves. Our role and responsibility in the preaching moment is to help people, to help, help them think through life's decisions, 
from the perspective of the scriptures and help them we our responsibility is to help them to, to live more faithfully the gospel that's our that's our responsibility help people to live more faithfully the gospel now, question hmm question sure okay um help me to help me to get this clear um what i'm hearing is that you're saying at the end of the sermon is not the only time that we we talk about the gospel message right right is that, is that what i'm hearing that's what i'm saying yep okay so during the course of the delivery of a sermon mm -hmm. the gospel message should intertwine all the should, be, oh, should yeah, intertwine yeah. within it yeah you so, know and it doesn't mean that you're going to talk about the death, burial, resurrection throughout that sermon. But in some way, it people ought to be because they are saved, because they are being called, because they have uh, acknowledged, have become followers of Jesus. How does what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? That's the gospel. What does it mean for me to be a follower of Jesus now in this world? Am, am I, is, is that helping a little bit? Yeah. So, so maybe I'm. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking, so the flip might, I'm just thinking in my mind, mm -hmm. so the flip might be more about incorporating the gospel in whatever you're discussing. Yes, yes. So all, looking at the whole of life, because what you want to do is help people to live more faithfully, live the gospel more faithfully in life. They, they, they I mean, because again, what God has done in Christ by raising Christ from the dead, that influences every angle of life, how we treat the poor. Uh, it influences how we give, how, we're good, how we treat people on our job. It, it, there, there is no part in, in our life where the gospel does not intersect. And because the gospel has something to say to us in that moment. From the scriptures. Is that helping? Yes, sir. Yeah, the gospel has something to say. You know, the, the, and this goes right back to uh, 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 our second hour. Salvation is not a get out of hell ticket. So the gospel is not just this get out of hell message. Sure, it does offer us reconciliation with God, but it also offers us reconciliation with humanity. Mm. Huh. And it teaches us how to treat. And so the gospel on a regular, we how, do, how what does Jesus have to say about the way I treat people? What does Jesus have to say with the way I use my money? What does Jesus have to say with the way to the political injustice and the disparities? of our time. What does Jesus have to say to economic inequities? Yeah, that's essentially what, Rollin, what Alan is saying. That, that's our goal is to help people to see things from a gospel lens. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Yeah, to live more faithfully the gospel. You, you, you're pondering that. You, you're pondering that. You, you, you have more questions? No, 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 no. I'm just, as you said, I'm just pondering. I'm just okay. feeding on anything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The worldview of people we serve are being framed during the moment of preaching. Perspectives are being changed during that moment of preaching. Yeah. yeah. You really don't know how people are really being the perspective, you know, and people's perspective are being changed even when you don't know it. Because preaching is not just about a an outward response. And just because they respond don't mean they get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. You just say stuff. Sometimes you know, I, and I had to learn this because I came in. I came up in a in a pretty excitable church. Wrap that organ up. Well, we don't dance at the pastor preaching. Pastor gonna walk to my house today 
Oh yeah, he gonna preach until he turn red. <laughs> but at the end of the day, whatever. Um, at the end of the day, I learned that preaching is my goal is to help people see life differently. They may not always like what life offers, but they learn how to deal and navigate through. That's why preaching is serious business. Mm. Because people are struggling regularly in life. Mm. Yes. And the last thing we need is people playing games in the pulpit. Mm. <clears throat> it's more than just a monologue. For sure. It's more than, yeah. It's not theatrics. Again, not saying that the preacher does not get happy. We all get, yeah, you're going to get happy. But mm -hmm. make sure, uh, make sure that they're getting happy off a of substance. Because good meat makes its own great. Mm. Need no added preservatives and all that other stuff. You don't need that. No. Mm -mm. You don't, you don't, when, when you got good meat, you don't need to add your own, you don't need to come together with this gravy, come up with, you know, uh, um, that quick gravy. I'm not the best cook, so if I got it wrong, don't, don't judge me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, I'm good cook. I, I'm, I can cook. I just want y'all to know I can cook, uh, but I'm, I may not be chefs like y'all. So just, <laughs> just saying. From the perspective of theological conviction articulated immediately above, the preacher helps the congregation name the world in three important respects. First, the preacher helps the community to remember the great creator's purpose, uh, purposes of love and justice for people and nature. Second, the minister helps the congregation name sin and its effects and agents. The minister encourages the congregation to recognize its own brokenness, the distance of the world from the purposes of God, its compl uh, complicity in the ways of sin and, and its impotent to make things right. Third, the preacher helps, uh, helps the uh, it's important it helps its in, impotence to make things right third the preacher helps the community understand how the gospel offers hope for the congregation and the world what does god's love offer each person community and situation what does god will for just i i, I didn't go fully into chapter six in tonight I'm, I'm gonna deal with the rest of it next week i just wanted to add i just wanted there, there was something that was significant in that moment um, but what but, but we, we got to realize, he, he, Alan is saying something significant to us, uh, that we are living in a broken world. This is tying all into what we've been talking about when it comes down to Paul. And that's what Paul identifies. We are living in a broken, fractured world, and we are part of it. And because we're broken. I don't want to admit that. And sometimes we're complicit in the damage that we do in the world. But the gospel offers hope that we can and we will do better. That just because the world is broken, that is not an excuse for escapism. Mm -hmm. It's not for us to just say, well, the heck with it. Let the world go to hell. That's the wrong attitude to have. Mm -hmm. Wrong attitude to have. So, I got some points that I want to raise if we're going to faithfully preach salvation from the perspective of Paul there are about five things we need to remember first it must always be mentioned that the work of Christ while having personal implication concerns itself with the reconciliation of all humanity to God in Christ 
So when we preach, if we're going to faithfully preach the gospel now, if we're going to faithfully preach salvation from the perspective of Paul, we have to remind people that yes, salvation does have personal benefits, personal implication, but ultimately it concerns itself with the reconciliation of all humanity to God in Christ. Um, uh, quickly, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Quickly. Oh, my Bible is over here. First, uh, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Chapter Five, and let's look at um, verse eighteen. And, and this is going to go right to my point. It must always be mentioned if when we're preaching, if we're going to preach salvation faithfully and rightly from Paul, salvation isn't just a personal thing. It is a personal thing, but it's more than a personal thing. But it concerns ultimately the reconciliation of all humanity to God. Notice what Paul says in verse 18. All things is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling, world, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their, trans, their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of God. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he has made him who knew no sin to become sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. So what is Paul saying? What is Paul saying? Our job is to reconcile. Our job is, we've been reconciled to reconcile. We have been, all of this is from God. Ultimately, God, God is at work in all of this. And God is at work in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I hear people talking about, I got this kind of ministry. I got that ministry. I got the ministry of deliverance. I got this ministry. I got the ministry of towels. and all. No, we've been given. The text, Paul says, we've been giving the ministry of reconciliation so that salvation, once I become a follower of Jesus, it's my responsibility to reckon, to, to work, to partner with God in this process of reconciling others, bringing others to God, and, and also each other. That even though we live in a broken world, we, the brokenness of this world, that there is no, um, um, no matter how broken the world is, God has witnesses. And you and I are those witnesses. And we are called to go into a broken world and preach a message of reconciliation. Come on back to God. That God is creating a loving family. Um, part of this whole issue of reconciliation is not beating people upside the head with the Bible. Mm. Oh, you going to hell. I saw preaching like that, preaching that, that to me is disturbing 
because we are called to I get that doesn't mean we don't call out injustice and we don't preach we don't preach against wrong. I'm not saying that. But I am saying the we have to be mindful that the ultimate responsibility in our presentation is not preach people into hell. But our responsibility is to bring them to God in Christ and let the spirit do the convicting if they're wrong. Amen. Sometimes we try to be the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're not the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I'm not the Holy Ghost. <laughs> And I'm not God either. That's right. You know what I mean? Um, but 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 to my original point, <clears throat> salvation is not just about my personal. I'm going, I'm going to heaven, y'all. Yes, I'm going to heaven. A gospel that does not influence the whole of our life I, it, or grace that does not, and Bonhoeffer would probably say this, any grace that does not, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, good theologian, wrote a book, uh, Cheap Grace, any, gra any kind of grace that does not influence the whole of our life is cheap. Mm -hmm. um, let me make it, let me move further. To faithfully preach salvation from Paul is to realize, watch this, that salvation is an already not yet event. Chew on that for a second. We are positionally in Christ, but each day we are progressively actualizing whom God has called us to be. Hmm. Already, not yet. Yeah. Hmm. I am positionally in Christ. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. Mm -hmm. When God looks at me, God looks at me as though I have never sinned, though I'm broken. I am in Christ. I am secured in Christ. But God is, but every day I'm being, I'm being worked on. I'm being sanctified. <clears throat> Set apart. Made into the image of Jesus. I'm actualizing what God has called me to be. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. So, preaching salvation from the perspective of Paul is <clears throat> to remind people <clears throat> you're not there yet. Even though you 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 saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, got Jesus on your mind, running for your life, wonderful. But your God is working on you. So if you're going to preach salvation from Paul's perspective, it's a reminder. I'm already. I'm trying to be what I already am. Man, that makes me want to preach. Uh, that's Paul, Paul. That's what Paul is essentially saying. I'm, I'm trying to be what I'm already, what I already am. That is already okay. Every day, I'm working to be what I already am. And even though I'm in principle in Christ and 
I'm safe and secured. I'm positionally in Christ. I got to, every day I got to deal with the, my brokenness. Yeah. And that's, what a beautiful privilege that God is working on me. Um, yeah. So we're going to preach the gospel or preach salvation. Rem let's remind people you're trying to be what you already are. Um, to preach faith, salvation faithful from faithfully from Paul is to invite your audience to become partners with God in the work of reconciling others to Christ. <laughs> Any preaching that does not invite people to get in the mission of God to reconcile the world to God's self is preaching that is woefully missing. It's 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 lacking. But people need to realize being saved, there are responsibilities. You didn't just go in heaven and that's it. But there are responsibilities. And we want to invite people to become followers of Jesus. And what does that mean by becoming followers of Jesus? It really means, literally means, I'm going into the world. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to follow Jesus into the world. Into a broken, messed up, unjust world. And you and I have the responsibility of telling people, you ain't got to stay in the shape that you're in. So that's what salvation looks like. That's what preaching salvation. Invite people to become part of God's mission. People, people need to become part of the mission of God to bring other, to reconcile the world to God's self. That's what salvation means. So if you're gonna preach, if you're gonna preach from the perspective of Paul, salvation from the perspective of Paul is gonna mean, hey, I got to go into the world. And the world is dirty. It's messed up. It also requires, if we're going to preach this, if we're going to preach faithfully from Paul, simple faith in what God has done in Christ by raising him from the dead is sufficient. There are no added preservatives to salvation. You don't have to try to, you know, do all that extra stuff. No, what God has done in Christ is more than enough. It was once for all. What God has accomplished in Christ was once and for all. And that simple faith in that reality is sufficient. Now, I didn't say that it does not bring about requirements because there are requirements to this whole same uh, belief in Jesus Christ. And therein brings me to my last point. No, that's not my last point. To preach about salvation is to remind persons of their immense value to God while acknowledging living in a fallen world. Stop there. Um, I think sometimes that in preaching, we try to remind people of how bad they are. 
Oh, you so sinful. Oh, you so sinful. Oh, you just so sinful. Oh, you just going to hell. You so sinful. But that's not, no. To preach about salvation from the perspective of Paul is to remind people of their immense value to God. that you have dignity and you have worth because you are created in the image of a loving God. Now, that don't change the fact that we live in a fallen world. And we have to acknowledge that we live in a fallen, messed up world. But even in the context of this fall, um, our fallenness does not destroy our dignity and our worth. No matter how sinful we are, what God has placed in us does, our sinfulness does not destroy our significance. Mighty God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't, so if you're going to preach, preach from the perspective of Paul on salvation, you got to remind people, hey, you are valuable to God. You are loved by God. You are, you are embraced by God. Because God went through all that God went through. God did all what God wanted to do in Christ just for you. Because of our immense value to God. To preach salvation from the perspective of Paul is to consider the implications of confessing the Lordship of Christ. Okay, need to just lean into this for a minute. And, um, to confess Jesus as Lord. It's not about just simply going to church. But it actually means that Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. That the political forces that are in power now, they are there simply on God's permission. That's number one. That's right. That's right. But, but number two, ultimately, Jesus is Lord. That's right. And those powers, out, no matter how evil they are, they will bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Yes, Amen. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what the, that, so to preach salvation from the perspective of Paul is to have the, 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 the your audience to consider the, what it means to confess Jesus as Lord. That they got to really realize that to, to make Jesus Lord is more than just, all right, I'm coming to church on Sunday morning. And so when you preach the gospel, when you preach from Paul and you tell, you know, that they got to confess the lordship of Jesus, it means that their allegiance has to change. That they can no longer bow to the idols that they have constructed. Their money. <laughs> their achievements. Yeah. That's what it means to to break to really. If you, I mean, if we're really going to preach from salvation from the perspective of Paul, it is to realize that hey, following Jesus is more than just coming to church. Yes, yes, 
yes. It's going to happen. Our mm -hmm. Jesus is being able to stick up for the marginalized. Mm. Yes. If we, again, if we're going to talk about preaching now, and we're going to mm -hmm. do preaching right, mm -hmm. uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, amen. it means we got to fight for those who can't fight for themselves. That's right. That's right. Got to be a voice. You have to be a voice. That's what it means to to live into the Lordship of Jesus or to mm -hmm. be, to follow or to uh, confess the Lordship of Jesus. It means, you know what? I'm going to speak up against wrong, no matter where it is in the church. Yes. And mm -hmm. in the world, <laughs> if it's sexism, mm -hmm. then my responsibility, even in the church is to call attention to sexism. Mm -hmm. If it's race, if it's racism, mm -hmm. my responsibility mm -hmm. is to call it out. If you're going to preach the Lord, if you're going to preach salvation right, then, um, um now, pastor. Sure. Reverend. Yeah. Okay. What, 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 I'm, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, and you're calling, um, Black Theologian. Black theologian perspective. That's what. That's where you're coming from. That's not this new church. You know, church. We don't call it out. Right. Right. We don't. We, we don't, don't need call it. it out. Huh? We don't name it. We don't, we don't, we don't call it out. We we pray. Yeah. And we say wait until another time. Mm-hmm. You know, black theology is what you're preaching, so I can see who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see who you are. Um, yeah. But in many places, they're not comfortable with preaching the message for the oppressed, mm -hmm. the um, people who are marginally, you know, um, just people who are not in the best place. Right. People who right. are not in the best place. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile if your ministry does not support you speaking out against the injustices, um, against um, injustice towards lesbian and gay, uh, injustice against mm. Uh, mm. all kinds of things. And there's a lot of things out here. I mean, it's, a, it's a lot of things um, that we could be talking about. And these are in our church. Yeah. These are in our family. These are us, but uh, in many churches, we don't want that spoken of, right? Because it's not pretty. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's it's funny that you mentioned uh, that subject of uh, lesbian and gay, um, because you know what I for the for six years wondered how I would do that. You know how I would address that, and one of the things. God had me learn from a, when I think it was the, uh, the shooting at that nightclub in Florida a few years ago. Yeah. I was, I used yeah. that opportunity for the first time <laughs> to speak out against homophobia and the mistreatment that we've given. And we're going to talk about this later on when we get to sexual ethics because we're gonna to have to wrestle with that because many of our lesbian and gay brothers and sisters have been dehumanized and marginalized and pushed to the side in the church yeah. we have we have and and in the church that i serve I, you know i make it a habit at some point to say listen um, they are the people of God just like you. Mm -hmm. They are called to live in integrity, you know, but they are the people of God just like you. And how dare we mistreat anybody because of their, who they choose to love. Now, guess what? That's not pretty. 
how do how do we reconcile women in women in ministry? Oh, we're gonna get to that too. We're gonna get to that in the next two weeks. Not a, not next week, but the next week. We're gonna talk about that. That that that's a that's a difficult call too. Yeah. Even, <laughs> even being a woman in ministry, yeah. <laughs> the leadership that does not always really support you. Ooh, we we that's and I'm sure right now once we get to that subject, that's going to really unearth some wounds. Yeah. Because, and 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 for for the life of me, I can't understand how we are still fighting today over women in ministry. When when the first preacher, the first ones to announce the resurrection yes. was women. <laughs> and y'all and we still fighting over this mm -hmm. we gonna get it listen we gonna go over our time because we can get we can stay in this um, <laughs> but you know sometimes sometimes you'll be called to difficult situations where your ministry will not necessarily be you know it will it, you won't get the support yes you know uh but I encourage I you know I use the available opportunities that God does give you, you know. Um, until God tells you something else, I don't know what God will tell you, and I can't. And it's not my job to give you that. You know, my job is to teach teach what we how we preach in Paul. But I will say this: pray for every pray for opportunities that God will allow you to opportunity to speak truth to power, because there will always be opportunities speak the truth yeah Thank you. yeah I, I use Facebook as an opportunity sometimes to speak the truth <laughs> it'll get be, 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 again and and to do if you're gonna do prophetic ministry especially from the perspective of Paul you better be prepared to get in trouble oh yeah mm -hmm. I'm gonna be by yourself yeah you <laughs> You, yes, yes. Because it's a lot of people don't want to hear the truth. No, you no. Know? And that's what our job is to speak truth. But it's not people, what you say; it's how you say it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But people need to realize there are consequences to confessing Jesus as Lord. Mm -hmm. It is not a cakewalk. No. Right. no. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. This is awesome. <laughs> this is just awesome. Yes. Because you don't have these kind of conversations. It's, 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 people don't want to talk like this. Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk like this. This is real talk. Yeah. This, okay. this, this course is, is going to be practical. Uh, my goal is at the end of this, I want you to get, I want, I need, it needs to be hands on. It needs to be concrete so you can take it with you because mm -hmm. you're going to step into a context. And you know, and when you go preaching, Paul, you gotta preach him right. Mm. Preach him right. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to give you how to preach him right. Mm. Questions or comments? All right. I'm good. Let's good. All right, listen, so um, papers are due on May the 8th, 1159. Uh, and I will, uh, next week, now please forgive me this week, I, I was supposed to have this other assignment written up for you. I'm sorry, um, I was preparing to preach and all that other stuff. That ain't an excuse. You're going to have it next week. Um, I'm going to have your, I'm going to have the work graded to you by, uh, Two, my goal is to have it done by Tuesday. Uh, to have it done by Tuesday so I can give it back to you with my comments. And, and which, then, which paper is this? This is about? the reflections. Uh, yeah, the oh, the one I just turned in? Yes, yes. Oh, but, oh you thought I made it eighth. I'm like, is there another one? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No. Okay. Yeah, so. Praise God. Yeah, so um, the next assignment that I'm going to. Uh, is the the big paper, which is the big assignment, and I'll I'll post that in the next 
few days. Again, it's 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 a fun, engaging assignment. You'll the first part is the harder part is the research, and then the next part will be really your how will you preach the gospel? I'm still thinking about subjects from Paul. So I'll have a list of subjects that you can choose from and you can write about it. And I'll give you, I'll give a detailed outline of what I'm expecting so that way you, so there are no surprises. And um, so right now, um, the reflection paper is the only thing that is- The only thing, that's the only thing you gotta okay. do. Um, right. I don't, uh, listen, you will only have three assignments so the one assignment is now a reflection paper then you have mm -hmm. the big assignment and then you have another reflection paper at the end that's okay. it Amen. and then participation that's that's mm -hmm. how i'm rating it so um you, you all will be fine okay well, have... participation isn't a problem because this is what you be, i've been wanting to talk about for a long time <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm glad I'm giving. I'm glad to give the space and the opportunity. Listen, I love this. I love the conversation. Amen. I love the energy that comes from this class. Amen. And so, um, Amen. You know, you all are making my first go round the best go round. Um, so, it's your first go round. Amen. My first go round. Uh, Amen. And so I'm, I'm appreciative of how you know we're we're forming and really working together. Um, but if there is any, again, if you have any questions, comments about paper, tech, email me, whatever, call me, you, you, I'm, I'm here. And um, if there's just any general questions about the lecture period, uh, I'm available to you. So uh, yeah. definitely do that. And I just have a quick question. Sure. Um, are we uploading this to Google Classroom? You can, or you can email it to me, either one. Okay. It'll be easy for me to upload to Google Classroom because then I won't have to convert it to a Word That's document. <laughs> Whatever you do is fine with me. I I'll get it either way, and uh, I'll I'll print it and I'll take it and take it home and read it. And then once I finish making, you won't understand my editorial remarks, so I'm not going to write them. I'm going to somehow edit it. <laughs> I'll edit it somehow so that way you can understand because you try to understand my writing. It's almost like writing in tongues. So when you submit, <laughs> when you submit, when you submit your paper, I will read over it and, you know, make sure we, we follow the guidelines and then give you a grade and call it a day. So, but, ag but again, the class is not designed to be difficult. So the, and this reflection paper is again for, your reflections. I want to hear what you've gotten out of the lessons. So, but, but May 8th, 1159. And it, now, <coughs> I will only allow for extension if I know there was something bad that happened. I mean, something bad, not that the cat died. You know, the dog. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it is bad. I mean, I mean, <laughs> That's <yeah>. bad. <laughs> Uh, uh, it depends on the relationship you I have. I had to miss class if my cat died. <laughs> oh mercy! But um, <laughs> I think we. I think tonight. Are there any other questions or comments? I do have a comment. My husband said he enjoyed you. He said, "Tell him I like him. I like him." <laughs> oh. Yes. Because my husband was kind of walking by during the class time, and he wanted me to let you know that he he's enjoying you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I, I, I hope again. I'm, I'm thankful again for the interaction of this class. Again, yes. this is it's a it's amazing, and so I'm hoping that we can that as we continue on in these next, we have now uh, three. We have more. We have one, two, three, six, five. How five more classes. This is week three. This, this is five week more classes. Five more this classes. Is week three. Five more classes. Yes. Sheesh. All right. So I got to get y'all y'all information. I got to get you y'all stuff. Oh, goodness. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Listen, by the end of this week, I have everything up for you so Amen. that you can start your project. Because I, because if y'all don't get to the end of it, that's going to be my fault. Then I just got to give y'all all the easy A. Um. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Take your time. Take your time, Pastor. Take your time, Reverend. 
<laughs> Don't stress yourself out. <laughs> but uh, thank you again for tonight, your attention, and even uh, to this class. And I look forward to reading your papers and getting mm -hmm. your grades back. And uh, we'll go from that. And I look forward to next week. We're going to talk about uh, Paul and slavery. So that's mm, going to be interesting. And we're going to talk mm -hmm. about that. So how do we preach the gospel faithfully now? Mm -hmm. Now that we're on the other side of slavery, you know, how do we do that? So I'm looking forward to that lecture. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. Amen. Amen. Hearts, right. and minds, hearts and minds are clear? Yes, yes. All right. Well, go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Sister Bass. Yes, ma'am. You should get an email from me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. You should get that email. You don't have my number?